Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Andrew Ip, and uh, this is the first of a number of video essays on 3D printing in the dental industry that I'll be conducting in the near future. So before I start, uh, I don't get paid for this. Um, I do, however, have to credit um, Zubin from a 3D printer store in New Zealand for giving me the idea um, to give these presentations. So if you're in the Australia or New Zealand area and you, if you are looking to purchase a 3D printer or get into 3D printing, um, I'd strongly suggest uh, you go to his website. So that's 3dprintingservices.co.nz. Um, I'm also supported by a number of other small companies. Uh, there's Kevin from CM Medical, that's Collective Medical, and uh, Michael from Bioholistic. So um, today's topic is a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, actually, it was inspired by a certain Dr. Adam Nolte from the IDDA, uh, who posted a, a series of, uh, I guess, um, uh, posts on his uh, Facebook uh, 3D printing page. Um, and it's something that surprisingly doesn't get uh, the attention that it deserves. Um, and it really should, because these days we're placing more and more of these long-term 3D uh, printed uh, prostheses in our patients' mouths. And ultimately, as dental practitioners, we are liable um, for, for uh, when, when things do go wrong. So um, we're going to go through basically this topic, validated workflows. It's, a, it's the boring but necessary truth um, in dental 3D printing. So without further ado, let's go through what we're going to cover today. So first of all, we're going to go through what is biocompatibility? How do we define it? And why does it matter? Uh, you know, what happens when we venture outside recommended workflows? And then in a somewhat related topic, we're also going to go through um, open and closed systems and whether there can be such a thing as too much of a good thing. So a bit about myself to start off with. Uh, I'm a Sydney-based uh, private general uh, practitioner. Um, I have been 3D printing for several years now. And actually, I first started 3D printing as a hobby. Uh, I was basically tired of uh, purchasing uh, Warhammer figurines. I felt they were overpriced. And so I wanted to print models uh, that I wanted uh, at a fraction of the cost. So I started printing uh, toys, figurines, stuff for my cats that you can see uh, in the middle picture over there. And gradually my hobby uh, basically flowed into my work. And now it forms a significant portion uh, of my general dental practice. So I'm involved in uh, 3D printing of uh, models for DIY aligners, um, surgical guides, crowns, veneers, uh, a whole range of things. Um, and even now I'm 3D printing green state zirconia. So it is a big focus in my uh, general practice, um, the, the concept of 3D printing. So biocompatibility. It's a very important word that gets tossed around a lot. And uh, if you ask 10 dentists, you're probably gonna get 12 different uh, answers. So we're gonna focus on two questions uh, with regards to biocompatibility. What is biocompatibility and why does it matter? So what is biocompatibility? Now, Rems and Williams had a definition back in 1992 it's basically the ability of a material to, um, to perform with an appropriate host response in a specific application. Essentially, it's related to the interaction of a particular material and the surrounding host tissue. And there's several factors that biocompatibility relies uh, on. You know, the function of the material, the duration uh, the material is in contact with the host tissue, and uh, you know, the, the location of the actual material as well. So theoretically, a material can be considered biocompatible in one region of the body, but place it somewhere else, and it may elicit some sort of adverse response. So how do we test biocompatibility? How can we tell whether a material is biocompatible or not? 
we essentially have these global standards called uh, ISO standards. And there's several that are particularly relevant to dentistry. So we have ISO 7405, that's in particular specific to dentistry. We have ISO 10993, which is measuring in vitro cytotoxicity. And ISO um, 109310, which is for irritation and skin sensitization. There's a lot of other um, criteria out there too. And here are some ISO uh, 10993 tests for evaluation. I'm not going to go through this table in any great depth, but I'm just going to give you an idea that there's a whole lot of, you know, there's many criteria out there um, which can be assessed. Um, and interestingly, you can see that um, on, this, um, on this table, that prolonged uh, duration is uh, the criteria for that. So what is considered permanent is actually only more than 30 days. So there's a lot of gray in this field of testing. And here's a continuation of that table, just to give you an idea that there's a whole range of tests available and materials will not be necessarily tested for all of these, uh, all of these criteria, only a select uh, number of them. So, who does the testing? You can't just send your samples off to any old lab. So, basically companies have to send their samples to uh, a certified lab, essentially. These labs are either ISO accredited or compliant with what we call good laboratory practice, GLP. And these accredited practices need to submit a sample of their scope, basically their scope of practice or scope of accreditation, um, at least once every two years. So basically your resin manufacturers would have to send samples of their goods to these um, labs and the, these labs would do all the testing for them. So what tests can be done? So initially, initial tests are based, is, there's a lot of tests that can be done. Initial tests aren't performed on live humans generally. They're more like cell studies or animal studies. And once again, I'm not going to go through all, all this in great de detail, but it's just to give you an idea that there are going to be a range of tests, like cell culture tests. So basically a material is added to a cell culture. And then after three days, um, you, they will basically measure or assess any um, changes in, in these cells microscopically. Um, membrane integrity assays, um, barrier screening tests and agar diffusion tests. So agar diffusion tests basically happen when a layer of agar is actually placed over the cell culture and the material is placed on top of it. And then after a few days, they'll assess if there's any changes to the cell culture underneath. Some more initial tests. So you have filter diffusion tests and then tooth slice culture assays, AIMS tests, um, styles tests. There's a lot of tests available out there. Um, I'm not a chemist, I, <laughs> I'm not a lab, lab tech, um, but you, you just get the idea that there's a lot of tests that are involved um, when we have to validate uh, certain resins. We also have usage tests. So what are usage tests? Basically, they're yeah, generally involving animals. Um, for instance, the inhalation test, um, the test material is basically dispensed in some sort of spray and aerosol and um, they measure any like a, an animal's response to that aerosol. And it's kind of like the next level uh, of testing when you compare it to those initial tests mentioned. Um, then you have, you know, implantation tests where the material is actually implanted in an animal or into an area, and then they assess the degree of inflammation afterwards. Specifically to teeth, um, there's pulp denting tests for restorative materials. So um, they will kind of like, um, you'd have a tooth, an animal tooth, or it's a rat tooth or some um, animal tooth, and um, they would use or place some sort of restorative material uh, in a prepared cavity. And then the pulp would be assessed after the tooth is extracted um, to see if there was any signs of inflammation. 
very similar in principle to pop capping and pulpotomy tests. There's a lot of kind of like, um, uh, in terms of the oral structures, uh, a lot of testing that goes uh, into um, uh, kind of like uh, placing your materials or your samples on these oral structures. Um, of course, this is relevant because we're dentists, we, we put things in mouths, that's generally what we do. Um, so yeah, these are kind of like some more usage tests that are conducted in these labs. Finally, there are diagnostic tests. On patients very seldom performed because ethically it may not make sense but you know things like allergy tests um, are conducted where it's kind of relatively safe to do so so I'm going to use a real-life example um, for testing and the example that I'm going to use is a product called uh, Ceramco Crown Tech which is a 3d printed long-term restorative material uh, to clarify, um, I don't get paid or rewarded by this company um, to talk about this product. I have been using this resin for a couple of years now, and um, I feel it's actually a fantastic option for patients who either financially cannot or do not want to invest in more traditional ceramic restorations. So it comes in a range of shades, and um, they, they come up very predictably, actually. And it's, I think it's one of the nicest restorative resins out there in the market. Um, and I've used quite a num number of them in my, in my practice. Um, the company itself, Ceramco, is, is, has been fantastic to deal with, I have to be frank. Um, they're very open um, and, and uh, by compatibility seems to be quite high on their priority list. So they've confirmed to me that um, CrownTech has passed a number of these ISO tests. Like for instance, we have ISO 1099318, exhaustive um, extraction. So that's when a product is actually immersed in water to mimic saliva and they try to detect if there's any components leaching out um, in, into the solution. Um, then there's others for uh, you know, skin sensitization, cytotoxicity, genotoxicity, um, etc, etc. So I was really actually impressed with how open the company was um, in showing that this particular product of theirs had passed all these tests with flying covers. And look, trust me, not all companies are as open as them. Um, and we can definitely appreciate honesty like that. Um, so yes, I'm using uh, Crown Tech uh, as an example of a biocompatible 3D printed resin. I, I feel it looks good, it polishes up well, and in the right case, um, it's a very adequate um, restorative solution. So yeah, this is one example of a particular 3D printed resin that has passed a number of ISO tests specifically, um, you know, um, with regards to biocompatibility. So the big question is, what does this have to do with 3D printing in my dental practice? So obviously many products that we print will have prolonged contact with the oral tissues. These can be fleeting um, or temporary in nature, such as you know surgical guides. They're not in there for more than a couple of hours. Or alternatively, we can have more prolonged contact um, in the mouth. It's, we have long-term um, restorations. I mentioned Crown Tech before, but we also have splints. We have dentures. So one study by Kim et al. Um, in uh, 2022 actually showed that certain photo initiators had higher degrees of biocompatibility, color stability, and accuracy compared to other photo initiators that were commonly used in other resins that were not in the dental field. So unfortunately, it is, the, it is often the case that you as a dentist have to accept any liability of any adverse outcome that does happen. Um, so you've got to be careful what you actually place in the mouth. It's all f good and fine until you get caught or something happens, um, and, and then it's, it's no fun after that. So that leads, my, it leads me on to my next topic, validated workflows. We're going to define what a validated workflow is, and this is really, really important. 
when we want to produce a biocompatible print because we really want to know that what we're printing, what we're producing is exactly what we want. Um, we're also going to see what happens when you venture outside some sort of validated workflow. So, what is a validated workflow? It's a lot of jargon, but basically a validated workflow is one that has been confirmed by the resin manufacturer uh, to produce a desired result. And theoretically, if you follow um, a, desire, a, a, a validated workflow, if you repeat a certain print, and you repeat the process of printing, washing and curing to the T, theoretically, you should be getting the same result. So for biocompatible resins, this is the workflow that is used to produce samples for ISO testing. And generally, any resin printing workflow involves, number one, you're obviously going to be 3D printing with an appropriate printer, hopefully. Then, no, Number two, you're going to be washing with um, some sort of washing agent that has been recommended by the manufacturer. And then finally, you're going to cure it in an approved curing unit. It's not just simply getting the right measurements when it comes to biocompatibility. It's about ensuring that the end result is exactly as biocompatible as it can be. And Unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you take it, this area will undoubtedly uh, kind of like receive a lot more attention from regulating bodies um, wherever you are in the world. I know the TGA in Australia, um, I have been in contact with them, uh, has a very keen eye on this field, and they will eventually uh, put in regulation um, and guidance, but uh, yeah, right now it's a bit of a gray area. So it's kind of like, you got to stay tuned. So, what happens when you venture outside a validated workflow? Uh, what, ha what can happen um, when you don't follow the steps that have been instructed or recommended? Well, you basically run the risk that whatever you, you want to print or your end result is not re reproducible and not consistent. Essentially, what you're what you print may not exactly be what you get. Um, here, this photo, I'm showing um, a crown or two crowns each um, of Graphi TC 80 DP. So this is a crown and bridge resin. Um, on the left, there are two crowns supposedly in the OM1 shade, um, cured in the auto flash. I think it's 2000 times two flashes. And then on the right, we have the same exact crowns but instead, these were cured in the Cure M machine, which is actually the manufacturer's recommended curing machine. And you can absolutely see that the shade that was produced was definitely not OM1, all right? That's close to an A3. So, or, um, yeah, uh, what, 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 what do you think can happen? This is just the color difference, let alone microscopically, I have no idea uh, what the structure actually looks under the microscope. So what went wrong? I even used you know, the QRM, which was supposed to be the, the right curing unit for this particular resin. So basically what happened was that in the instructions, it actually specifically mentions that TC80DP should, prints should be actually placed in the provided metal bowl. So when you get the QRM, you actually get a metal bowl with it. And um, it was my mistake. I didn't actually put the crowns in the metal bowl before curing it. And as a result, um, I got this unintended shade, uh, this really yellow brown shade um, at the end. And when I repeated the result with um, the metal bowl, uh, then the shade that I got was correct. So it's funny, small things like that, you've got to pay really close attention uh, to the instructions of use. Now, this is another great example. And I conducted this example when we were in lockdown, there was nothing to do, and I was bored. And here I, you know, I had this experiment where I cured drops of optoglaze, standard and high viscosity, one drop each, under different curing situations. So at the top, you can see the auto flash, um, 200 flashes seemed to perform well. There was very minimal discoloration. Then also the Asiga flash, um, after two minutes in the Asiga flash, 
a very, very minimal um, discoloration, if not none at all. However, with the Velo at about 20 seconds, you, we started to get a, a slight yellow tinge, especially in the, the, the high viscosity um, uh, optoglaze. And the, the Velo is actually one of the recommended light curing units for, for optoglaze. Then the QRM had disastrous results. You can see how amber basically um, the results got. Um, and this is just the appearance of uh, the result, let alone what is actually happening microscopically. There could be some sort of structural uh, defects or um, it may be more brittle compared to, to normal. We don't know. Um, so and I mean, imagine if you were doing some 3D printed veneers, let's say with Crown Tech, um, and you decided to do some sort of final glaze with, um, uh, with optoglaze, and then you cured it in the QRM. Your B1 veneers will certainly not end up looking B1. And ask me how I know, this has actually happened to me. Um, so uh, definitely you have to um, be careful with the instructions that um, each resin manufacturer has given you. By far the worst performer um, in this experiment was the Densply Smart Light Pro. Um, you can see, yes, they are clear, but the reason why those drops are clear is because actually nothing cured, they were still fluid. Um, so yeah, the, the Smart Light Pro just could not cure optoglaze at all. I'm not saying that any of these products are bad or good. Um, it's, it's just for this specific product, the optoglaze, some curing units were definitely more unsuitable uh, compared to others. This is another example um, of how important it is to follow instructions. Um, this is Crown Tech, um, the, the long-term restorative uh, resin that I mentioned earlier. Now, on the left, I have two shade tabs. Um, printed in shades B1 and Snow White, SW. And then after soaking them in boiling water for two minutes, which is in their instructions for use, you can absolutely see the change in, um, in, in color. You get the true color after basically the heat. Um, you don't get that very yellow um, um, you know, uh, result on the left-hand side. You get the result on the right-hand side. Uh, you can see that the, the color saturation has reduced, the yellowing has reduced. So it's really important that you actually f uh, follow the instructions to a T uh, so that you can get reproducible results. So open and closed systems, how does this relate to a validated workflow? You know, what's the difference between the two and are there any advantages um, or disadvantages of one system over another? Think of open systems where, they're printed systems where the, the specific printer is actually not tied down uh, to printing its own manufacturer specific resin. Basically, there are validated workflows for third party or external resins um, for that particular printer. Um, that being said, it's not so black and white. Um, there are some printers like, uh, you know, the Accurator and Sprint Ray lines, they have validated settings for a certain number of third-party resins. Um, but in my part of the world, which is, you know, the Australian New Zealand region, I would actually consider the Sprint Ray system as actually a closed system because many of these third-party resins aren't actually available to purchase here. So um, I'm not saying that Sprint Ray resins are bad or the Sprint Ray system is bad. Not at all. It, I use it every day. But it's it's just basically over here in my part of the world. I do I would actually consider the sprint ray system as a closed system. It's just the way that things are here. Closed systems. So closed systems are, are where kind of like the printer is limited to the number of resins that you can print with. Like you basically can only print with um, the resins that the premium printer manufacturer has created. Think um, of Formlabs in Vision Tech. These are two popular um, closed system uh, printers out there in the markets. And um, 
example is uh, flexerous mal, which is a very popular resin. Um, it's generally only supposed to be printed on the Envision Tech. And um, often in closed systems, the software and the hardware um, of these closed systems are actually optimized uh, for one another. So they really kind of gel well together. So, open and closed systems, which is better? Um, and there's honestly no good answer to this. I think everyone's immediate reflex is to always go for the open system. We like choice, we like freedom, you know. I want to have the freedom to do whatever I want, print whatever I want. And I th that's good. Think of um, open systems like uh, the Android open, um, op operating system. Okay, look how many Android phones there are in the market. You want an Android phone? Look, there's so many different brands out there that you can get. Now, you compare that to Apple. Many of you actually may not realize, but that's actually a closed system. And I'm sure a lot of you are using iPhones. So before you start bagging out, um, you know, closed printer systems, um, you know, take a look at yourself in the mirror, all right? If you're using an iPhone, well, you're actually using a closed system, all right? And one of the reasons why a closed system can be advantageous is that the manufacturer can actually focus on its own software, its own hardware, and its resins, and how they all link up together, okay? Once again, look at the success of Apple and how they've made their products link up to each other um, so seamlessly. It's, it's not just a phone anymore, you know, it's, it's almost like a lifestyle choice. So you have to co consider what you really want to print. Do you really need to have 10 different model resin options um, that may require different cure units uh, for the workflow to be validated? Or do you just need the one that will work for you? Um, a great analogy for us dentists is, you know, how often do you actually change the composite that you use? You know, is it really good having that much access to that many different products when you only need that one that will work for you consistently and reliably? Um, that being said, if you do choose a closed system, you, you do have to expect that the price overall will be higher. Um, this is the trade-off. For instance, uh, I, have, I have an Invigitech D4K Pro. It's a great printer, I like it. Um, it's a closed system, okay? Um, the software is easy, for, for, I feel it's extremely easy to use. Um, definitely better than average. And um, the default so support settings uh, for each of its resins is really, you know, generally on point. I really don't need to change much when I, um, you know, press that button um, to support my, my prints. So I'm mainly printing Flexera Smile on that, on that um, and it prints consistently um, with no issues. Yes, the resin is more expensive, but you only need a couple of failures here and there um, to ruin your day or your mood, you know. Open versus closed system, there's no right or wrong. It's just what you find important or what you prioritize. And that is a very individual uh, thing. So, to summarize, uh, biocompatibility is probably a little bit more complicated that, uh, than, than what we assume. You know, there's a lot of testing involved to assess a whole range of different criteria. And you must follow validated workflows set by each resin manufacturer to ensure that what you're actually printing is exactly what you're intending to print. This is particularly important, you know, in biocompatible resins. Some of these resins are going to be in people's mouths for more than a couple of years, in my experience. So, validated workflows also depend on the printer that you're using, you know, whether it's an open system or a closed system. And, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages um, for each. You know, if, if, if you liked this video essay, I hope you enjoyed it and you found it thought provoking, then feel free to like and subscribe. Um, otherwise, you can follow me on my socials, um, Instagram, uh, AI Ortho Implant, and my website link is there um, if you um, want to kind of keep in contact or send me a message, or if you want to keep updated on any of my 
you know, future hands-on courses, which I'll hold, you know, here and there in Sydney and potentially in Australia. Um, so I hope you enjoyed the, the topic. And if you have any suggestions for any future topics or discussions, uh, please let me know. Um, I'm looking for more niche topics that people don't really talk about or don't want to talk about um, because uh, there's a lot of things in 3D printing that um, manufacturers will spruik to you, um, but um, there's a lot of nitty gritty stuff that no one will talk to you about. So if you have any suggestions on any future topics, uh, just make a, give, put it in the comments and um, yeah, I'll, I'll see you soon.